Let's start with our standard protocol. 30 seconds of quiet time. And so we can uh, petition the Lord, uh, restore ourselves on fellowship. <clears throat> and um, I'll start now with the 30 seconds of quiet time. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray for your blessing on this time. <clears throat> We're together in your word. Help us to understand these great truths and how they impact our relationship with you and how they impact our life of being able to walk with you and um, help us understand the purpose of uh, suffering as this is the case. And uh, I just thank you for all the truth that you give to us and help us to uh, see from your point of view the absolute truth you provide for us. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are on <clears throat> October 22nd, 2023, Sunday. Um, we're in Ephesians 3. We're going to be doing uh, verses 13 through 15. We're actually halfway through 13, or relatively. And um, so I read that to you. We talked a little bit about it last week, and we'll finish this and then we'll do a little bit over here on prayer in general since that's the subject starting right here <clears throat> and um, I noticed as I was looking here I thought I had a bunch of verses for here where did they go well they're up here <laughs> so you'll just have to sort that out <laughs> but they don't make any sense you're reading them up here they belong down here I think it's uh, this set right here that should have actually been down here but so it goes. It's not the stupidest thing I've done today, even yet. So let's uh, start where we kind of left off. We're going to take a, a step back. One verse, of course, just to kind of see where we're at. <clears throat> and um, because it is pulled forward. Um, verse 12, he says, In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. And this is our relationship with him, as we've talked about before, uh, our boldness to be able to approach God the Father in prayer uh, because of our standing uh, with the Lord. And uh, then in verse 13, uh, he says, I ask you, therefore, do not be discouraged uh, because of my suffering, my sufferings for you, <clears throat> which are for your glory. Now, he asks us, if we remember this thing, this is in the uh, present middle of indicative, the ask, which tells you that it's not just, um, if it were active, it'd be like he's just talking to you. But given that it's in the middle, what it's telling us is that he's making a personal appeal on behalf of himself because the middle voice has that to it that he is making a personal appeal for himself to them and um, w this shows the relationship too because it's a personal appeal he's not just dealing with a, a Bible study principle he's making that appeal because he loves them and that's why he, he kind of puts that in there uh, for uh, for for us to know but to be seen by this very conversation about what the middle voice means. And he says not to be discouraged. And if we remember, this means faint at heart. And the sufferings here is talking about the imprisonment uh, in Rome that he's now in uh, due to um, uh, his uh, issue in Jerusalem. Now, remember, this is, the second, this is the second of the four years that he's in Roman prison. And um, you know, this actually has a really great principle, and principle in it, too, is that uh, the reason that, that Paul got imprisoned initially is because of his own stupid mistake. <clears throat> and what he did is that God told him not to do it. He did it anyway. And we know that from the book of Acts, where if you remember, that's the appeal one. He's going there uh, to, to give them the, the, uh, the money and so they can buy food because at that time in Jerusalem, uh, they, are, uh, they, have, they have a famine in the land, so there's no food. So he's helping out the brothers in the church. Um, and he goes there when he doesn't really have to go there. And he makes a stupid vow, if you remember the vow in the temple. Uh, all the people were warning him not to go. The Holy Spirit's warning him, but he does it anyway. 
this sounds familiar. Like, it's not just Paul, it's us, okay, when God leads us not to do really goofy things, uh, but he does them anyway. And for that, he spends the first uh, two years in prison in uh, Caesarea. <laughs> if you remember that part, we covered that weeks ago. But then he, um, as he's coming out of what is called reversionism, that's what we call it, it's like backsliding, but a much better word. We understand driving in reverse or going backwards. And, and that's really where he was at, is that while he made this stupid decision and violated God's desire for him, what happens as a result of it, he gets put in prison, uh, which is not a fun thing to do. Um, but he gets himself there by his own error, by his own error, and some of that was uh, he he walks into this trap um, that the uh, Jews have for him in the temple, and we talked about that a, a little bit uh, with Trophimus back a couple weeks ago, where um, he didn't take Trophimus into the temple, but he was accused of that, and that's why the rioters wanted to kill him in that setting. But at this point, what's happening, and he's saying here, my sufferings for you, which are for your glory, his sufferings are for them, meaning the Ephesians, and for us, because there's a parallel here uh, for us as Christians, because we get the benefits. But as he, uh, this is a great principle of memory, when you do something really stupid, <laughs> well, or you even do something maybe just a little stupid, your responsibility is, is to confess it and swing your mentality back to Bible doctrine that has been taught to you. So we know very clearly that this happens before Romans. Paul has the ability to write a fantastic book like a Romans and then get himself in this kind of position. So it tells us that sometimes spiritual maturity doesn't stop you from doing really stupid things. Right? We know this from Abraham when he tried to give his wife away twice. Right? We know this from David. He, he kills Goliath. He's this fantastic man. And then he does all these other really stupid things that cost his nation. So, we, so we're not immune to it. We, hopefully we just don't do it uh, as frequently uh, because the, the path of spiritual maturity isn't a, um, you know, you go from elementary to to mature it doesn't ha it happens like I'd say it looks like this but sometimes it looks a little more like that okay we've talked about that many years uh, so that's where he's at but what he's doing now is he's taking these looking back uh, what he's done and he knows what that is um, he doesn't sit here and confess it all over here saying I'm really was stupid I did these stupid things but if you know the Word of God and you know the Bible doc of principles and you see all the warnings that the Holy Spirit has and all the believers are having don't go don't go go and you see it and then you see him make a vow which he, he in his epistles he tells not to do you can see that he got himself there but one of the nice things about it in the in the isolation of being in prison and being um, humbled, this comes up later, the humility part, um, he, he looks back and he reflects, he restores his relationship with God and he looks at what he's done and not only does he restore himself but God allows him to take what he did stupid and make it much greater. Okay, and God does that with us all, all the time. The wonderful thing about God's grace system, and it is a grace system, when we do stupid things and we confess them, God allows us to be restored from them, sometimes making them even greater than we would have been before. Okay, that's the suffering part. Many times in your suffering, you learn much, much more, especially the more you grow from it. And that, that's exactly what's happening here. Now, the, the, the better part of suffering, we're not doing a class on suffering, but the better part of suffering is that you suffer <clears throat> because you're doing what is right and good. And Paul experienced plenty of that too, um, when he did what was right, and yet he suffered because he did what was right for God. Uh, we run into that today. As a Christian, when you talk about Jesus, you immediately get flack and people hate your guts because you made the mistake of using the name of Jesus, okay? Um, so there is a persecution going on in Christianity. If you haven't noticed, you don't obviously, either you don't know the Word of God or you don't know the news, one or the other. My hope is that you just don't know the news. But you can, you can re it result in blessings for suffering. That's the way to do it. Now what Paul did here, he did it wrong. 
But God still blessed him because he turned back to him, which is what God's desire. When we have our children and they do stupid things, it gives us anxiety. It gives us pain. But in reality, our happiest moments is when they turn back right? We're very happy about that. We, we get to see them grow. We get to see them, and this is what happens with God. We get to see them have these wonderful blessings that are the result of them turning away from what they did wrong, okay? So that's what he's doing here. What results from his suffering, from his goofiness, from his suffering that's still going on even though he's restored, because we know that when we make bad decisions sometime, our relationship is immediately fixed with God, and we can go on, but yet you still have the suffering from the stupid mistake. That's where he's at. That's kind of like somebody's at. When somebody commits a crime, and then they become saved, they're still in prison, okay? Because there's two pieces to that. So this is where he's at right now. And this part where we ran into with the glory part, is that the glory that he's talking about here, because we asked it for the why. You know, why is this suffering for, for them? Okay, is that they benefit from it. And, we, and the glory is part of their spiritual maturity that will stand on top of the foundation that Paul has written in the prison epistles. Okay, and that's uh, prison epistles would be uh, you know, Ephesians, uh, Philippians, Galatians, and Philemon. Now, we've done two of those, okay? We're not going to do Philemon, but we probably will do Colossians next because it's, a, it's one of those fantastic spiritual books that gives us insights into our spiritual life of spiritual maturity and growth, which is what he is learning here. The greatest growth that Paul did was in those two years, those last two years in Rome while he was uh, writing these epistles. There's nothing like it. Okay, those three books. So that, that glory that he's talking about for us, meaning us, is because we are studying this book. And if you are studying it with me, and we are taking these truths that God has given you through his word and through the Holy Spirit, and you're comparing them and, and adding them together, you should be having a lot less trouble with your spiritual maturity. In reality, now that obviously depends on your positive volition towards what God the Holy Spirit is teaching you, okay? If you don't grow from it, you're no different than anybody else who heard profound truths, but you ignored them, okay? But this is an opportunity with this great, fantastic book of Ephesians. So the glory is when we take what we're taught by God the Holy Spirit and the truth of, this, of these mystery doctrines and of Ephesians, we get to utilize that doctrine and make it, put it in our lives and make less mistakes because he is showing us the way of spiritual maturity. And by walking in spiritual maturity, we glorify not only God, but we too become glorified. We get the glory. We know this is true from the, from the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat, because we've studied that part, where when we are there getting rewards for walking in spiritual maturity and contributing greatly to the plan of God because of our spiritual walk being mature, according to the word of God, not according to the pastor or your friends or your Christian community. Right now, the community Christian community couldn't find its way out of a paper bag because it has surrendered the mystery doctrines and the doctrines of these things. They're still stuck in Matthew. Um, but what happens here is that by utilizing those at the Bema seat, if you remember that piece we studied when we were reading about that, that, that the Lord will present us, the Lord Jesus Christ, will present His good and faithful servant who spiritually matured and succeeded in fulfilling the duty that God the Father gave to us as part of our Christian commission. We actually did it. We actually looked for it. <clears throat> what happens is that we get presented to God the Father and the elect angels in front of them, and everybody goes, <laughs> fantastic job. And we know from some of those that, that some of those feats will be written on the pillars of heaven itself. We learned that in the first three chapters of Revelation when we did the book of Revelation. All 250 classes of it. But 
That's what that means right there. So what he's saying is this from, he is taking us, and you'll see this through this next verses, is that God, that Paul is taking us through God the Holy Spirit to divine viewpoint. Okay? He's taking us a level up. Regular people have a viewpoint here. Most Christians have one that's not much farther above it. Mostly moral. But God's viewpoint, it's way up here. And what God's trying to bring us to, he's trying to bring us to is that, you know something, if you look at it from God's view and God's plan, which we've talked about, this whole book has been about that, God's a plan that brings him pleasure and he desires us to be part of and he asks us to when you attend a Bible study that's what that is God asking you through the person who's teaching through the Holy Spirit speaking to your spirit who speaks to your soul and invites you to do it God's way that's divine viewpoint what you think is called human viewpoint unless God's viewpoint resides in you which is what Bible learning is about. It's about getting God's viewpoint. So right here, he's taking us to that by saying, see these sufferings? Nobody wants to go to jail, but see where these sufferings are going? These sufferings that I am going through, Paul says, are for you and for your glory. So stop being faint in heart. See? Divine viewpoint. This takes us beyond what we think as human beings and allows us to see that suffering is something God many times uses to take us a level up. Now, I'm not saying I like suffering, but I'm saying that we prepare every day of our normal life when we are learning Bible doctrine and applying it in everything God puts in front of us to when something does happen for us to take that level up and follow the same thing, like muscle memory, except this is soul memory, okay? It's called recall. When I was in this bad spot, I recall what God did. I rested on what he told me to. I had faith in him, and it was delivered, and I got all this from it. Okay, that's, that's what that is. <clears throat> so that's, that's the whole point of that piece right there. Now, the verses that we were kind of doing here, so the, the, the part here is, is, remember, is about being discouraged. That's what it says here. But it's about being faint-hearted. And his recommendation for this also is that if you become overwhelmed with, the, uh, with, with your uh, circumstances, in this case, them talking about Paul, what happens is it neutralizes, it, it neutralizes your Christian walk and makes you vulnerable to um, making bad decisions out of divine viewpoint. Now, the only way you can accomplish what God wants is to be in divine viewpoint. You have to have God's point of view. Now, I remember drawing this thing up before, but if I had a great big marker, I put, there's two things. There's a capital T for the truth of God. T, truth, aletheia, aletheia. And there's a small t for human viewpoint. And this is how humans think, but they are very, very different from one. This one here, human viewpoint, most of the time gets into trouble and does things wrong. This one with the capital T is God's viewpoint always is right. Now, it doesn't mean you always see it's right, but it means that from God's point of view it's right. And it will always have a maximum eternal effect. Okay? So that's why we should pick one over the other. I was just talking to my daughter telling us, this is why you pick, this is why you pick something that you know is true. You, 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 Pick it, even if you don't believe it, even if you don't, if you're struggling with it, you pick it because in this case, God said it's true. So it helps us to go to that part. Um, the other part is that one of the things that they're concerned about is that their teacher, Paul, who was their teacher for many years, three years, if you remember that part, in the uh, uh, missionary journeys, um, he was their teacher there personally. He didn't found the church, but he did teach that church and brought them up. Many of these people he's writing to now, years later, from the prison writing them, he's telling them that don't be discouraged. And they're discouraged because another part is that he was their teacher. He was their one that was mo moving them up to spiritual maturity. Now, a a teacher who teaches spiritual truths in our world today is worth many pieces of gold. 
Not because he's anything, but because he teaches that truth. He takes the gift that God gave him, and he studies and studies and studies, and he puts it together, and he presents it. And you can tell if you should be there, because when you implement those truths, you are blessed, you are happy, and good things happen. Now, that isn't always true, because there's lots of people who listen to great doctrine, um, and in reality, don't have good lives. But it's because they don't apply it, or because they don't believe it. They throw something out. Well, you know, that doesn't sound right to me, so... I'm going to toss it out. I'm not going to do that one. Well, every truth that you toss out is a blessing that you remove from your life. That's an important thing to remember. Is that, am I talking about blind trust in God? Yeah, kind of. Okay? Because God's not visible to us. But He's left us something that we can confirm in our lives. I mean, I remember years ago, somebody was asking me, and this is long ago, why, why do you follow God's Word? What is it about it? I said, because when I look at God's Word, and I look at the time I followed it, He is 100% right. I mean, I've looked back now, it's like 34, 35 years, and every time I follow God, I get blessed and things go perfect. Every time I follow what Richard thinks, not so much. Sometimes they've been pretty disastrous, okay? But even then, when I've done those stupid things, and I turn back to the truth and I do that, guess what? It re reorients itself, and it follows God's path. And I get blessing from it, I get truth from it, and many times I, like Paul, learn from my stupid mistakes. That's Christianity. God knows who we are. There is nothing offered by anybody, anywhere, that has that to it. Nothing. That's how you know God's Word's true. If you look at your life and you look at the part where you follow God, you see blessings come from it. They just flow right out. They, they not only flow out, they come out in a way that you cannot even imagine them. Okay? So my, what's happening here is Paul is trying to relate to them that guess what? Not only I know I can't be there to teach you, but look what I got for you. Okay? This is my best stuff that God has ever revealed to me, and it is fantastic. So do it. Stop whining about me being in prison, even though he loves them. Do it. Because it's to your glory. Now the verses we have here in verse 13, <coughs> um, the first one is going to be 2 Corinthians 12.5. And 10. So those are two separated ones. And my title for here is that when I am weak, we, when, I, when we are weak, we let God do his work through us. It's important to remember that stuff. Is you know something? It would be nice if God could work with our strengths. But God sits there and says, you know something? I don't need your strengths. I've got more strength than you do. So your best thing is to be humble is to get out of my way and allow me to utilize the spirit I've put in you, which is my power, and the truth I've put in you, which is my truth, and let me work from you without you interfering in that. Okay? He says, I will boast about a man like that. Now, he's talking here about a verse previous to this. He's talking about himself, actually, in the third person. You might remember this, man, but let me read the verse first. He says, I will boast about a man like that, <coughs> but I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. Now, he's talking about humility. But if you remember this context, the man he's talking about is actually him. And it comes from the part that when he was in Lystra, in, Gal in the uh, Galatian area, Galatia, Lystra is one of the towns, that's when he got stoned to death. And they dragged him outside the city. And he got to see heaven, if you remember that. And so he, in reality, is the person that he's talking about when that happened to him and God used that. He stood for God, he got killed for God, and God brought him back. Um, hopefully you know that, and that's not a complete confusion to you. But he says, the, the, the critical part in here is that, 
but I will not boast in myself except about my weaknesses. And these weaknesses is really saying, without your works, Paul, I don't need your works. See, what happens in churches a lot of times is that they say everybody, okay, you know, the first thing you got to do is start working. That's the stupidest thing. What you're having to, when you have young Christians going out and doing stuff for the church, you have a bunch of idiots going out and doing the stuff that they knew as human beings because they haven't learned anything yet. They haven't been in Bible study yet. They don't know God in reality because they don't know His truth. They haven't learned it. What they should be saying is that what you really need to do, young Christian, is come to every single Bible study, assuming they teach the Word of God in a truly doctrinal way. That's an if. Won't do anything with that. <clears throat> and then when you learn something, and after you've matured a little bit, then you can do some things then you'll have enough to make good decisions based on what God has taught you. And you can have positive volition towards the things that you know God's guiding you to and negative decisions to the things God's not, de not designing you for. Okay? Many times Christians get involved in things in church for which God does not want them to be in. But what happens is that they end up spending their time in things that the pastor or the teacher or the administrator or somebody in that church wants to have done. In reality, they should be doing something else that God is leading them to. But they don't have enough discernment. So in humility, they accept the truth from that person because they don't know any better. They don't have any doctrine to protect them. And that's what doctrine does, protects you. And the pastor, teacher, administrator, whoever. Uh, that, that happens frequently when somebody says, why do you teach a Bible study? Not understanding that they don't have the gift of teaching. You know, they just don't have it. <clears throat> and they haven't matured enough to give anything other than good human advice. So it's important to know those two things. Now the key to this is just like the key we're talking about, about is divine viewpoint. So verse 10 says, we're jumping from 5 to 10, uh, for this one, he says, that is why, for Christ's sakes, for Christ's sakes, I delight in my weakness, in, in insults, and in hardships, and in persecutions, and in, diffic in difficulties. For when I am weak, I am strong. We know that verse, but we don't always understand what it means. From the divine viewpoint, God's saying that, you know something, if I, you know why I can delight my weaknesses? Because God can use me when I get out of His way. God can use me when I get insulted and I don't respond to that. People wonder, why didn't He respond? When you have hardships and you depend on the Lord and you keep your RMA, relaxed mental attitude, in spite of your hardships, people want to know why. You know why that is? Because you are witnessing to them by your very behavior, by the words that come out of your mouth, which is the thoughts that come out of your head, and in persecutions and in difficulties. You know, the church, when it first started out, wasn't very smart. It actually started out with a lot of mistakes. But many times, they went through the persecutions, the insults, which they got plenty of, and they had plenty of hardships, and they had plenty of difficulties. But they did them in faith. And because they went through them and dealt with them with a smile, and with a heart that smiled, a soul that smiled, they converted the entire Roman Empire. It went it's like wildfire. The empire... The emperors were all paganistic. They wanted to wipe it out. They started killing Christians and say, yeah, we know how, we're going to wipe this out. And what it did, it was like throwing gasoline on a fire because they did what shows on this thing. When I am weak and I have faith in the Lord, I am strong because He is strong through me. Okay? That's the whole thing. We see that right here in this same verse. <clears throat> um, in Colossians 1.24, this is on attitudes. So this is coming back to the part of faint-hearted. It says our attitude should be, this is my, my title. I always put a title on them. It kind of gives me a direction. Our attitude should be plus H. That's the happiness of God. And filled up with Bible doctrine because we're always still lacking. And I have a little note here is that you learn that from daily doing Bible study. I do a Bible study every single day. My wife does a Bible study every single day. 
because this is true for us. We are always lacking in doctrine because God is always the willing to give us more and more and higher and more. And the way you stay on track is by doing it. So this verse says, Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you. This is Colossians, same, same, um, same environmental context. He's still in prison, right? Colossians prison epistle. And I fill up in my flesh. What does he mean by that? He means in my life, in my what we call phase two, the part after salvation, before death, okay, in his daily life. What is still lacking? What is still lacking? If Paul says, what is still lacking? Do you think you have a lacking? I have a lacking. Is that I want to fill up my lacking in my life to understand God more and more and more. Okay? That's the, that's the, that's the path to spiritual maturity. In regards to Christ's affliction. Why is he bringing Christ in here? Because he is suffering, Paul, in prison. And he's looking at Christ's suffering. And he's comparing the two of them side by side, so he, he knows how Christ suffered. We know how. We've read, the, we've read the first four books, right? We know that part. And we see where we're suffering, and then he compares them to him. Now, what did, we all know what happened to Christ's suffering, right? What, what happened with Christ's suffering? I mean, not just his daily life, which they tried to murder him, kill him, and do all kinds of awful things. But the cross, what did God do with the tragedy of death? on the cross. What did he do with that? Spiritual death saved the whole world. Made that offer. Everything's paid for. Come to me. You will have eternal life by faith in me. That's pretty monumental. Paul's looking at himself saying, in my affliction, when I look at what my Lord did and what he suffered, I can compare mine to him, knowing that my life will also produce these great things, these worthy spiritual things for God the Father, my Lord and my God. That's what Jesus said from his humanity. He is looking at that. See, he says, in regard to Christ's affliction, Jesus Christ is suffering in phase two, for the sake of his body. Now, he's not about Jesus' body. He's talking about us. We're the body of Christ. That's what he's talking about. Which is the church. Okay? This is a parallel for him, the model, to help Paul keep himself in a divine viewpoint. Even though I am suffering, he's doing a great doctrinal comparison as how does my suffering compare to that of Christ. Not comparable. But his suffering will have the same result because that's what God does with it. Okay? You don't think that's true? Let's read the next one. James 1, verses 2 through 4. My title for this one is Pure Joy. Happiness of God, advanced doctrine ahead. Gnosis to, to, uh, to application is epinosis. Now, some of you know what that means. Those are two Greek words that we use all the time. But he says here, this is, and, and this is divine viewpoint. This is not Richard's view, viewpoint. This is not my idea of good. But this is God's idea. This is James' idea, the half-brother of Jesus. He says, consider it pure joy. <sighs> my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, it means that they happen in variety. We, we, need to be, we need to be tempered in many, many ways. Every area of our lives, physically, spiritually, you name it, all of them. Okay? Because you know, isn't that a great thing to say? He says, because, because you know, he says this twice. What does that mean? Because you know that testing of your faith produces perseverance. And he goes on. But he says, you know. How do you know? How do you know this is true? It's an axiom. Okay? It's an axiom. You know this. You know that Bible doctrine produces the absolute truth of God that allows you to orient yourself to that truth and know where you stand from the divine viewpoint and what happens to you. That's what he's saying. He says, because you know, this is James, that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. That's faith rest. Let, let perseverance finish its work. That's when faith rest has a result. Okay? So that you may be mature. Yeah, that's the way. And complete. 
that tells us that maturity when we are working when we are working in our lives and we're maturing maturity is a path it's a growth it's not an end okay so we become mature by learning God's word and we start applying it and then we started getting persecuted, we started having problems, and now we can reorient. And as we learn through all these things and we apply this, we mature more and more and more until we become complete. What's complete? Galatians 5.22, 5.23, when we become Christ-like and we can apply the Word of God to everything and stand with complete, relaxed mental attitude. Are you there with me? I'm just making a joke. We're not, okay? <laughs> this is a long path. It'll last until the day we die. But then he says, so that, he says, let perseverance finish its work so that you may mature and be complete, not lacking anything. What's the anything? Spiritual maturity, Bible doctrine, application, errors, so that you may not be lacking anything. That's the, that's the trail the path to spiritual maturity and spiritual maturity is the maximum effectiveness in your life to God's plan that simple Jesus did the same thing we know that is because if we with the scriptures say that he suffered Jesus suffered that he would become complete okay the victory on the cross the, the moment he said, Lord, into your hands I commend my spirit, that's the complete. Okay? But he suffered all along the way. And that was required of him in order for him to grow because he was a man. Even though he was perfect, the humanity part of him had to mature with him. That's why it says in, in, in Matthew where it talks about him being 12 years old. He, he learned the scriptures, remember? He was 12 years old. He already reached maturity at 12. And he was asking all these questions of the, of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they're going, well, let me think. I don't know. I don't, that's really a good question, you know? But he knew those things. And that path from that time for those next 18, 19, 20 years that he went, he suffered just from this thing. This exact path is the one that Jesus uh, followed, okay? The super grace life, the life of spiritual maturity, is not an end. It's a path. Spiritual maturity takes that time. Let's go to the principles before I spend the entire class on half a verse. <laughs> okay? The principles here is that the Ephesian believers are very concerned. They're, there is personal uh, with them, and they are concerned that their teacher is not going to be able to take them to that next step. But he is, and he's going to do it through this book that we're reading. And if we pay attention to this book and make this book ours, we too will follow that path stronger because the truths that are spoken in this book are greater than any of the truths that you find in the Word of God, certainly in the New Testament. This is, a, this is attested by virtually every scholar who has ever studied this book. So it says every Ephesian believer are concerned about him. The Ephesians are Paul's situation. Their concern, Paul's use of the iterative, this is actually the piece that his, his concern is what they call an iterative, which means that he is repeating it to them. He's repeating it to help them understand that, new, that fear, fear what's happening to him from their point of view, because it's shaking their world, that's the whole context here, will neutralize their walk. And they need to take a step up to understand that this suffering has a great purpose. And that purpose is to the glory of God. And if they participate in it, to their glory, not just in time, when somebody looks at you and says, I want to be like him. I want to walk like they walk. Okay? If they have any doctrinal orientation, or that you will be glorified in the judgment seat of Christ, which both of these have. Point two, Paul presents the divine viewpoint, encouraging them while he is in chains. They are in hu human viewpoint, most of them, writing them the greatest spiritual epistle in the Word of God, along with Colossians and Philippians. 
and to some extent to Philemon. Three, Paul states clearly that his tribulations are for them and to their glory. We've seen that, that this is spiritual maturity's opportunity for us too. We're in the same spot. And the last one here, this is, this is a, a real news mind. This is a perfect example of Romans 8, 28. Okay? And we know that. That in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. You look at the beginning and you go, Paul, what a dope you are. And you look at the end where he's turned back to God and God has used this great stupidity of, of Paul to produce this magnificent doctrine that will help Christians if they lend themselves to it, the opportunity to greatly fulfill God's plan. The last one here is for we remember that Paul was originally in prison because he was the epistle to the Gentiles. And it started there. So let's go to the next verse. <clears throat> and um, this is where the verse actually, if, if we remember this, what we talked about, this ends the parentheses. Okay? So we have this. This ends the parentheses. If we did this right, uh, we would do this. Right? Parentheses ended. And where the parentheses started, if you remember, was in verse 2. Uh, we don't remember, but, but parentheses is really, like we've talked about before, parentheses is really that when Paul, um, when he's saying something, all of a sudden he remembers something that's really important, so he just comes back to that. It doesn't sound like that there's any continuity, and there isn't, unless you know about parentheses. And then he talks about all these other things, this and that, like that. But it's really a really important detail. And then he comes right back and finishes his prayer, okay, which is where he's at right here. <clears throat> so this is the end of the parentheses, and it says here, for this reason, I kneel before the Father. Now, if you remember this, when you go back to verse 1, he, he, has, he has this verse the same thing. For this reason is identical to verse 1, because he jumped off of it. Okay, He jumped off and went to a different subject. He started the prayer in verse 1, and then he starts right now. So it's like if we went for a journey okay, on all the important pieces that he wanted us to know before he went into his prayer. That's what he's doing here. <clears throat> so in this one, um, Paul begins his second prayer. So this is his second prayer. If you remember, his first prayer was in first, uh, uh, Ephesians 1, verses 15 through 23. That prayer was the emphasis on spiritual wisdom. Here, his emphasis is on love. Now, the problem with teaching a regular class to people, if I, if I were standing in front of a whole bunch of people and talking this with Christians, the first thing, oh no, all that stuff, okay? This is not talking about this love. This is agape love. This is the love of God. Does it have an emotional component to it? Yeah, it does, but in a way that we'd never understand. But in reality, God's love is not really understandable by human beings. We experience it. But it's so far beyond us. It's like, uh, you know, when God says, I'm going to give you eternal life, you're going to live forever. Well, try to try start thinking about living forever. Your little brain just go tweak. What do you mean forever? You mean as long as God has been around that direction? I'm going to live that long this way? Yeah. That's it. His love is talking about confidence. It's talking about a relaxed person who has confidence in him, has confidence in his truth, has confidence in the provisions of God, his Holy Spirit filling us with that power, his truth taking us beyond we could possibly understand. That's the love he's talking about in verses 14 through 23. We're going to be venturing through this. <clears throat> but notice, notice the first prayer is for spiritual wisdom. And the second part is what? The application. Okay? You have to know what you're doing before you can apply. This is the part I was telling you about in church. Sending young Christians out to do something is sending out your stupidest people to do things for God, and they're going to make a train wreck of it. You need to give them spiritual wisdom. You need to keep them from saying stupid things. Because they will. Why? Because the day before, they were saved. And what did they have before they were saved? The day before, what did they have? Human viewpoint only. No, no God viewpoint. Maybe divine establishment, 
principles of God, you know, that apply to everybody, but not the divine spiritual wisdom they need to be the speaker for God in their life. Okay? They don't have that. Notice this follows that same plan. They're a chapter apart, but they have that. The, um, oh, there, there, just a note here, one of the notes, is that some of you, if you have the King James Version, if you've kept that, it's kind of a train wreck, uh, although it was all people had for well, a couple hundred years, you know, 1611 to today, but it's been replaced by many, many better versions that have better translations. The New American Standards, one of them, NIV, plenty of them. Uh, so the part that says, where it says, if you have that version, it says, um, before the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, it's not there. Not bad to say, but it's not there. Okay? It's not in the original language, which is easy to find even online. You can pick it. Um, so the next piece here is that, um, where he says, for this reason, um, this is really literally, um, the wording here is literally of this grace. The, the word itself means of this grace. Okay? It's an idiom for, for this reason. And this occurs identically in verse 1. So we know that he's reiterating it to help us understand that he is now starting into the prayer he started in verse 1. Um, the, uh, like we said before, verse 2 through 13 is parenthetical. Now, he says here, I kneel uh, before God the Father. So, if, I don't know about you, but I don't kneel when I pray. My knees would be a train wreck if they did. And most people my age, if they kneeled when they prayed, would never get up again. Okay? Um, but just to put it into context, well, I'll give you the bigger thing, is that the, the normal prayer in the New Testament when Jesus was on the earth and Paul was on the earth, was standing. In reality, it wasn't folded hands. It wasn't closed eyes. In reality, it was standing with your eyes open, looking up. That was the standard prayer for that time. Now, I'm going to give you some other verses, just a couple of them, when we get to it, that shows that kneeling was an unusual way to pray. Okay? It was an unusual one. And we'll, we'll follow that, especially back for the greatest prayer ever spoken by Jesus in Matthew 26, 39, which we'll read, when he falls on his face. The Christ himself, when talking to his Father, is not kneeling. It's on his face. Now the kneel here is to bow. Uh, it's actually the posture of a priest. And reality has to do with his reverence for the Lord. It has to do with his reverence. It's a Because if you think about it, how could Paul be kneeling and writing this prayer? He, he couldn't, okay? It, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, it's, just, it's an expression of his deep reverence and humiliation and adoration for God the Father, which we, when we approach God, should always have, okay? That is a orientation point for us as believers, Okay, what happens is because of the grace we have with the Lord, and I don't know if you're like me, but a lot of times I'll talk to the Lord anytime. You know, just hi, hi, Lord, how you doing? Yeah, thanks. Let's talk about that stupid stuff I did. You know, I just, and that's what it says to do. We are to pray like a hacking cough. That's in Philippians, right? So we pray uh, continuously. Okay, it calls it pray all the time, but it's not. Now the word here before the Greek word for this is pros. And what the word pros means is the preposition. It means face to face. It means intimately. So when we pray, we are intimately, we are intimately face to face with God the Father. In a spiritual sense that when we pray to Him, we are in the Holy of Holies where He is at talking to Him. Okay? With all those millions of miles between us. Now, the word father here is pater. And this is, um, most of us are familiar with that, but this is a, an important part because there is a, um, um, there's a joke in here, okay, th that is in this verse that follows to the second verse that is a play on words, okay? It's a play on words for us. And, um, but note that he prays his prayer to God the Father, okay? Not to Jesus. 
He doesn't pray to Jesus. Paul doesn't pray to Jesus, doesn't pray to the Holy Spirit. And this is the protocol. Christians have access to God the Father through the Spirit. That's in Ephesians 2.18. We'll cover that verse. <clears throat> now he says, uh, gonada, which is the word for knees, which means for here, he's not on his knees. It's an earnest prayer. It is a prostration. It's a bow. Okay? That's taking place. Examples of a standing prayer is Mark 11.25. We're familiar with that one. That's the one with the Pharisee and the other guy. But it happens that way. So let's go to um, our, first, our first prayer. Uh, John 16.23. He says, and I have my title for this, why we say, G why do we say, why, the statement, we say in Jesus' name to the Father. Um, and he says here, in that day, this is Jesus speaking, okay? So this is the guy himself. This is the main guy, author and perfecter of our faith. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. What day is that? Okay, I read the context, so I'll help you with it. That's the day when he's not there anymore. He's talking to his disciples. He says, in that day, when I'm not here anymore, see, they don't know what he's talking about, when he's on the cross in his resurrection body, and from that time on to ours, um, you will no longer be, be able to ask me anything. Verily, truly, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask for in my name. Okay? In my name. So when we say, in Jesus' name, here's the protocol set up before the church age even began. But he's talking about the church age because he's talking about when he'll be gone. So this is the protocol that we have given to us by Jesus himself to pray in his name. Pray to the Father in the name of the Spirit, I mean, the name of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. That's right down here. I wrote it down here. To the Father. Okay, and notice that Paul's prayers to the Father all the prayers of God. Jesus' name, prayers to the Father. Okay? Never to the Holy Spirit, never to Jesus himself, always to the Father. In the name of the Son. And here's some of the verses here. Okay? And in the power of the Holy Spirit, we'll get to that. But here's one of them here. We'll read one. <clears throat> now, Philippians 2.12, uh, it says, we, we kneel, this is my title, we kneel all before Jesus, but this happens in our resurrection body, just so that people don't bring this one up and say, yeah, but he says this, okay? Because the context of this, of this verse in Philippians 2, which we studied, by the way, go back to your notes, is, this verse is the context, is the rapture. He says, in uh, that, uh, at that name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Now, when we're in our resurrection bodies, that kneeling will be a prostration of reverence for Jesus Christ, okay? And we, if, you, if you want to look through some of the other pieces of that, that was in our original study, and I covered all that when we did it. Ephesians 2.18, this is how we do it. We have access through the filling of the Holy Spirit to the Father, which means that we don't have access to God the Father if we are not filled with the Spirit. Note what it says here. He says, For through Him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit, Holy Spirit. That's how you have it. And this answers some of the questions down here, is that in reality, if you do not have, if you are not filled with the Holy Spirit, that God does not listen to your prayers. How do we know that? We know this part up here, that in reality, <clears throat> that when we are have sin, and that's the only reason we get out of fellowship with God the Father, <clears throat> is that if I regard iniquity in my heart, God will not listen to my prayers. We know that. Okay? So, in order to fix that, you do 1 John 1, 9. I confess my sins to Him. And He is faithful and just to forgive us of the sin and, at the same time, cleanse me from all unrighteousness, making me righteous before Him in time and in person. Now here, uh, Matthew 26, 39 is the one I was telling you about. This is the most beautiful prayer ever spoken to the Father. 
And I think you'll get it when you see it. This is Jesus speaking in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he says, going a little farther, I'm just taking it out of that piece for you. He fell on his face to the ground and prayed. This is Jesus. He's not kneeling. He's on his face, flat down. And he says, my father, if it is possible, may this cup, that cup's the death on the cross, spiritual death. He's not worried about physical death. The spiritual death where he gets the sins of the world for three hours. That's the most painful side of Jesus Christ. All of our sins. <clears throat> he says, may this cup be taken from me. This is my, yeah, Lord, I don't want the persecution, Lord. No, no, thank you. Just, just teach me, I'll learn. Okay? Now, he's not in the same spot there. But what he says here, which is the most beautiful part, he does, he, you can see, this is the only, I'm going to call it complaint, this is the only thing Jesus talks about. He never talks about anything else, being removed from me, or who will be suffer. He says it right here. Lord, if there's any way, any possible way, that you can take this cup of the sins of the world on me, please take it. Yet, not as I will, but as you will. Most beautiful prayer ever happened. That is the one that Jesus personally submitted himself to take that torturous three hours. Not the other stuff, not the nails. That was, that was kid the game compared to the sins of the world, our sins on him. Okay? The principles here was that prayer, prayer on the knees is truly a reflection of Paul's humility, his concentration, his earnestness. His heart is totally devoted. The position does not lessen anything that we see in these other verses. Number two, prayer is to the Father. Those who pray to Jesus violate Christ's Christ direct teaching and pray to a mediator rather than directly, face-to-face, -face, pros, to God the Father. This violates, uh, this violates our relationship that is personal and real with the Father. Okay? And we'll get to some of these other things. But if you can violate this one, you can violate this one. Okay? If you can violate talking to somebody, if you can violate talking to Jesus and the Holy Spirit rather than to the Father, then why not not worry about power of the Holy Spirit? Fellowship means nothing. Because you know something? You love Him. You care about Him. And gee, wouldn't He listen to you? No, it's a violation of protocol. It is a system of grace that God has put forth that only works. Works just by itself. That's it. This is the plan. This is the guy who you're saved by. It just works one way. Because that's the only way. Just like the cross. So, we'll come back to that. And let's, let's close it before so, tape runs out or something. Dearest gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, you are great, you are awesome. There is no one like you that you would give us such great, great things that the suffering of one of the most wonderful Christians would reveal these great and powerful truths that we can claim. That we can just claim them. Get out of your way by humility and claim your promises and let you do the great work. I pray this in Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.